times in this campus, but this is because I, I collaborate with a couple of complex scientists here, uh, Alex Arenas and Vijay Guimera. So I was in the building in front, uh, very nice campus, and you know, nice to uh, meet you all today. So um, we're going to talk about institutions and pro social behavior, and this is joint work with uh, Irma Cox, or Tornan, and Fabien Cugial. Um, so let me ask. Let, let me first uh, up kind of a preliminary uh, thing on the on the research question. We started this this project uh, several years ago, and the the motivation was that we think that trust, or rather lack of trust, has a lot to do with with uh, things that have happened. Well, that happen around us all the time, but also in Europe, when we got the, the Great Recession, at the beginning of the Great Recession, one of the things that, uh, that was common there is uh, this idea that Northern European countries had that we had a very big crisis in the 90s, so Germany, Sweden, they had a fairly large crisis in the 90s. And, and they more or less solved it on their own. Uh, it had a pretty large effect, so particularly in Sweden it was, it was, something, it was a major thing. But the, uh, the unions, the employers, they sat down together, they figured out a plan, they, they, uh, they controlled the wages for a while to, you know, until things were doing a bit better, they introduced reforms in the economy, some of them were kind of painful, but there's, uh, they did it. And then when at the same time, Italy, Spain, uh, uh, Greece, they had these bigger problems, uh, they found it strange that we weren't able to maybe reach a decision. So why don't you do the same thing we did? You control your wages for a while, you know, it would be better after that. And then, and it was very hard for them to understand that we live in societies that are very low on trust. And, and because we are low on trust, it, it's difficult to reach agreements. So the, the Spanish unions uh, were, you know, I, I showed that, used to show this, this graph where you see that in Spain, until 2012 or 13, wages were actually going up. Uh, in the UK, at the same time, from the beginning of the crisis, wages go down. So in Spain, all the adjustments went through with quantities when in the other countries went through uh, 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 through prices. And part of the reason is simply if you are a union negotiator and, and the employer tells you, you know, why don't you make a concession now and then when things go well, we're going to do better, they simply don't trust them because there's a tradition of, of uh, well, they're, they're doing this thing, they're, doing, uh, they're saying this thing, but they will do the others, I don't trust them, so I will just keep the bargain that I have now because it's the best that I can. So that started us thinking, uh, what what's the importance that uh, institutions have in societies in which um, opportunistic behavior is rampant. Um, and that's the first. So is there demand for institutions that protect against opportunism? And in particular, what drives the demand? So from the example that I just gave, it's, we think it's the experience that people have of misbehavior that actually drives the demand. Um, and also, Kind of a secondary question is, does the way demand is expressed, that is, uh, do I just purchase some kind of protection against opportunism, so that's an individual decision, or do we all together make a decision about whether to protect ourselves or not matter? So uh, when institutions are supplied, it's, it's important that they're voted or that they're uh, individually uh, demanded. So that's our first uh, kind of question that we're going to try to answer here. A second uh, strand of questions is, is there a link uh, between institutions and uh, these institutions that protect misbehavior and, and, uh, and opportunistic behavior? And so it's positive or negative. And you could think it could go both ways. So in particular, you could think that maybe uh, Northern European societies had more stable institutions and that's why they trust more one another. So it's a history of well-behaving institutions, whereas we've had badly behaving institutions, and because we have badly behaving institutions, then that's why we have no trust. But it could be the opposite uh, way. It's precisely the fact that I've had an institution 
trust is not needed because I've had a good institution, there's no need that I trust. And then, so it could go either way. And we wanted to find out uh, to which extent institutions can be complementary. Sure. Yes. Can I ask you a question? How, so how do you define trust in relation to institutions? What's the definition of trust? Because you gave us this example, you talk about civic behavior. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to be more precise in a second because this is a, a, um, precisely because this is hard to measure and it's a bit vague. So traditionally there are two ways to measure trust. One is through surveys. So the European Value Survey or the, the World Value Survey, they have this question, uh, can we generally trust people? Then that's a general, and, and you measure, so in some countries they say yes, and the proportion of people who say yes, they can be as high in Northern Europe, it can be as high as 90%, in Southern <coughs> Europe is, is lower, uh, in developing countries it's even lower, so that's one way to measure trust. A, sta a different way to measure trust is using the game of trust that we're going to, I'm going to show you in a second. So, so it's, a, it's a game in which I make a decision, and and I allow you to kind of respond to that decision. If you respond well, then we all benefit, but I need to trust that you're going to make a good response, and I'm going to tell you in a second what it is. So that's the, the, the measure of trust. And now, institutions you're going to see is ways in which individuals can protect themselves from the responder to my decision taking advantage of me in a, in a, in a, at a time when I'm at a disadvantage. So for example, trust, in the example that I was talking about, trust is I, as you know, union leader, I make an agreement with you, so now I'm going to lower my, my wage expectations because there's this recession, but in exchange for this, three years down the line when things are going better, you should give me a big raise. And, and what I'm saying is, I'm, putting my, I'm giving up something now in return from something later, and giving something now has a value, and we're going to increase the pie from everyone because it avoids that my, my, the company goes down and we're all going to lose if that happens. But, of course, the trade-off is that I need to trust that when the time comes, you're going to give me my view. And if, if I don't think so, then you know, one way to protect myself, for example, is this. Um, so, uh, labor, labor uh, protection legislation is very strong in Spain. And I think part of the reason is that no one trusts that, that if you know, we could have, maybe if, I, if I'm unemployed, then someone is going to take care of me. If I don't trust that when I'm unemployed, someone is going to take care of me, I'm going to hire later, then I prefer to be protected on the job right now. Mm -hmm. so, but I, I'll be more precise in a second. There was another question? OK. Very good. So um, literature, so there's, of course, a kind of big literature now on, on whether institutions that perform well lead to good economic outcomes. I have a couple of papers there. There's this new book that uh, Asimov and Robertson had published very recently that, that deals with this. Uh, um, there's also a kind of very big literature on, on trust uh, and civic norms, how they are correlated with positive performance. I have a couple of papers there on that. Um, so we are connected to those two literatures. Um, there's, of course, uh, the other literature is, is uh, kind of a closer connection in terms of the social capital is related to better institutions. So, Putnam for Italy documented this some time ago. Now, causality is hard to establish in, in, in many of these cases, and it can be bidirectional. Most of these literatures are with cross country studies when they try to go to causality. Uh, they need to do things like, you know, children of immigrants and, and, and so on and so forth. So it, it's difficult to find a good um, uh, kind of instrumental value in this, in this point, and therefore uh, that motivates why we go to an experimental approach. Sorry. Now, <clears throat> even closer connected, <coughs> in particular these two papers are probably the, the two that are more, more closely connected in terms of the motivation. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> both of them show that, uh, in, and both of them are, are mostly correlational. So Akion and company, they have a paper in which they first have a model uh, linking the existence of, let's say, bureaucracy and lots of legal protection with lack of trust, and then they see that this correlation that the model established actually exists in reality. So countries with lower levels of uh, trust in others also have a lot more legislation, a lot more legislative activity, and a norm, and, and kind of bureaucratic norms, and so on. And Pinotti has a, a kind of related uh, paper on this. 
So that's another closely related literature with respect to my second uh, question on institution and, and norms is that sometimes institutions can result in, in, in weaker civic norms. And there's a bunch of uh, papers in there. Um, so that's kind of the framework where we are working. So let me now go to the to the experiment. So that can finish this introduction. I don't like very long introduction, so uh, I'll go to uh, be a bit more precise now. So this is a survey that we did online with the Amazon Mechanical Turk. So basically, you 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 send your uh, tasks online uh, to <coughs> they're actually called Turkers, the workers that Amazon uses for this. Uh, initially, this started the, the Mechanical Turk started as a tool for companies that needed someone to do relatively uh, not very complicated tasks that they didn't want to do in-house, like checking code, uh, and then you might have a program that is very long and you, needed, you wanted someone to check it for you, and so you send it to these people that have lots of time and you pay them relatively little and they do the work for you. Um, and now some experimentalists uh, found this, this tool and they've, uh, they started using it. So, we're going to, to do a game that has two phases uh, and then a questionnaire. The, the game will have different treatments uh, that find out the, you know, the mechanisms that we want to understand. Antonio, just to understand. Yeah. So, <coughs> the pool of these workers, um, so I guess they, they come from multiple countries? No, no it's mostly US and... I think India. I mean, okay. It's not certain, not Europe and uh, okay. uh, labor. You, you need to do this. You need countries where la labor legislations are a bit loose, okay. and, if, and most European countries you couldn't do the kind of you know someone does a task for you, I pay you a few dollars, a few cents. Uh, it would be very difficult to do. Okay. Yeah. And it's useful, this, this setup, I mean, um, I guess this, the sample, um, you think the sample is useful for your question because... Well, it's, it's not necessarily students, for example, we wanted to have a wider population, <coughs> population of students, it's uh, um, diverse, both in levels of education and socioeconomic status, it's relatively diverse, so we wanted to have a variety of people. Those were the two okay. okay. Um, yeah. So the, the 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 experiment has two phases. The first phase is the same in all experiments, and it's only the second phase that changes in all in all the treatments. It's actually more than three, but but I'll, I'll tell you exactly why uh, three. And then uh, payoffs are communicated at the end of the question. Okay. So. Uh, Phase one is a modified trust game. I'm going to explain in a second what this is. Um, and it's played strategy method. Uh, so this is a game in which uh, the, the game has a sender and a receiver. When a game is played in a, in a laboratory <coughs> or in, in, in this uh, in, in strategy method, it means that you have to say what would you do as a sender and what would you do as a receiver. Now the, the sender has only you know a binary action, so it's easy. But as a receiver, you have to say what would you do under uh, if the sender made this decision, if the sender made this decision, and so on. <coughs> and then computer then decides whether you in fact are A or B. If in fact you are A, then it matches you with someone that in fact is a B, and then the outcome of that decision is what actually happens. Now, there is um, um, kind of a a possible difference between doing this in what is called the hot model and the cold model. So, uh, uh, Jordi Brands and Gary Charnes have a paper in which they they measure for different kinds of games what's the difference in uh, in the in the way people decide when they're making in hot mode, which is I'm actually the receiver. This is what I do because now I am the receiver, uh, rather than. I could be a receiver, what would I do if in fact I turn out to be a receiver? And not always, in some games it's very similar, so it's a little bit different. Casari uh, and Kaysson do uh, ha write a paper which specifically for the uh, trust game, they measure what's going on. 
and they showed that uh, strategy method does not make make a difference in terms of trust, so the, the decision of the sender. Uh, there's a small shift down in trustworthiness uh, for the receiver, but, but the qualitative features are the same, and then we decided to use them. We thought that that's good enough for our purposes. One difficulty with, uh, with the Amazon Search platform is that it's difficult to do experiments in which someone takes a decision and then the a receiver takes a decision and that you have to put back in contact because these are people that are distributed over, over the country. They would need to be sitting at the terminals all at the same time. Uh, so that this is good, so that's complicated. Whereas if you send like a questionnaire, essentially it's like a Google form in fact, uh, although we did it with Qualtrics, but you know, you could do it, many of these things with a Google form. You send them a Google form, what would you do with this, this, and this? They reply and that's it. You don't need to have everything, uh, everyone together at the same time sitting in front of the terminal. So that allows you to have uh, a large uh, sample uh, doing the experiment, so that's kind of useful for us. And that's why we decided to go for strategy method. Uh, if you ever have to do a, uh, an experiment, if you can avoid strategy method, that's probably better because people in reality make their decisions not in this conditional form that game theorists think about, but rather on the spot. But in some cases it's not too bad, and, and I think this was not too bad in this particular case. And the trade of in our case is the, the, the size of the sample is expanded as well. <laughs> Okay, so this is the trust game that they play. And it's a modified trust game in a sense I'm going to explain in a second. But as a player, you have to choose between the following two options. Uh, you can choose 100 for yourself and 100 for player B. Um, and then, uh, or you can uh, s uh, send all your money, your, you send uh, 400 uh, and then Player B decides how much of it uh, is distributed between the two of you. So either you, you have a hundred and the other has a hundred, which essentially means I don't do anything, I don't trust, so I, do, I keep the money, or I send money to you. If I send money to you, it multiplies. So this is like, a, think of this as a business opportunity that allows the money to grow, uh, a decision that is kind of risky in some sense, but will allow the, the, the company to grow. So this is, uh, this is you either allow, uh, you don't allow the, the company to, to do anything, we keep the, the steady state, or I allow that my wage goes down because that will allow the company to survive, <coughs> but then I need to uh, think what you're going to do, what the responder. So this is, this is let's say, the player A is the, the, the worker that is giving a concession to the company, and player B is the company. It says, now, I have a concession from the worker, I have to decide how much I give back to them. And I am completely free to do whatever you want. So I have to decide an amount. Uh, so as player B, you have to choose X and the amount allocated to player A and something for and then So I so I give X to player A, I send back of the 400 some amount to player A, or I keep uh, and I keep the rest. Okay. And the X can be anything anything from zero to uh, 400. So I could give everything back to him, or I could keep half of it, or I could keep zero. Yes. In the phrasing of the questions, what about your considerations on this framing effects, the, the bias towards losses and gains? How do you consider this? Because in these kind of settings, how questions are being really Yeah, I'm not about. sure exactly uh, losses and gains. So one thing we did because of, of this is the fact that uh, in the standard trust game, so let me, I said this was a modified trust. In the standard uh, trust game, you have a hundred and you have to decide whether you send any, any amount between 0 and 100. And then the other person takes your 100, multiplies by 3, and goes to 300, and decides how much to take back. So one thing to avoid this kind of framing problems is the status quo decision is symmetric. Everyone has 100. Uh, so the status quo meaning I keep everything. Uh, it means it doesn't mean the other person has nothing. So in the standard trust game, if you if you don't send anything, the other person has nothing. Whereas here, if you decide to do nothing, then the other person has something. So, so we've taken some consideration for that, for example. And also, so rather than being zero uh, or you know, it's just a hundred. And there also, the other thing is there are only two decisions. So it's either I trust or I don't trust, rather than a continuous trust decision. So we wanted to 
make it relatively easy to say it's a, it's a binary decision. I either trust you or I don't trust you, rather than all these intermediate levels. Also, because if you have the intermediate levels, in principle, you would have to, to say, if the other person has sent you one, how much you give back? If the other person has sent you two, and then, and then it's a very kind of cumbersome kind of decision process. So the fact that the player who decides how much he gives back uh, is because you want to measure, uh, you want to measure uh, trust this way. Yeah. So, so trust, trust is measured here. So I, I either trust or I don't trust. And what I measure here is the trustworthiness. So the decision of the second player is: is this person someone I trusted him? But was this person someone I should have trusted? So if the other person sends back nothing, then it's not very trustworthy. If the other person sends you half the money, maybe even more, then it is very trustworthy. And you, you see that this is going to play an important role in, in the following. Right. So do you have a threshold to decide whether... Yes, I, I'll give you the answer. And what is the role of the institution here? The amount that are given... No institutions the yet. Okay. No institutions yet. So for the time being, this is... The game we are played before we create institutions. So in the second phase of the game that I'm going to show you in a second is, is precisely what determines that. So for the time being, this is just I measure in trust. Okay. So the relationship is just one shot. It is one shot. Yes. Yes. So. Yeah. Because once you start having a repeated version so of the game, then then. It's a bit more than trust because it's reputation, so so you create a yeah, more complications. Okay, so uh, now phase two is divided between <coughs> the different treatments. So one is the pure institutions treatment. This is what we could, what happens when you can actually purchase the the protection, and then there will be what we call the voting treatment, in which the institution is created by a global decision. So this is an individual decision to protect oneself. So players are divided into groups, and this is how we measure the how to divide the groups. So it's the groups that return more than 150, and those that return less than 150. And we divide the, the groups into, into uh, in this way. We four individuals in each group, and group one is what we call the high trustworthiness group, and, and group two is the low trustworthiness group. So you're, you say, now you're going to play in a society in which people are trustworthy and, or you're going to be in a society in which people are not trustworthy. What do you do then? And uh, again, we're going to, uh, to go to strategy method and we're going to allow them for four levels of protection. Those are the four levels of the, of the institution that we're talking about. So the sender can choose now between, in the second phase, between uh, institution S1 and institution S4, when S1 is no protection, so just like the original game, or S4 means maximum protection, <coughs> so I can, uh, I can get uh, at least uh, the money that I put in the game. So uh, the receiver in each of these institutions has an option, still has an option, but the options are different between the, the three. So, any, um, so the, the, the institution basically determines an interval uh, that is given by the contract chosen, and then the computer is going to inform you uh, the group you are in. So in particular, these are the, uh, the four institutions. So under institution one, the amount allocated to the, to the sender when you send back is between zero and 300. So you can have either zero, you can have up to 300. So you, of course, always keep 100 for yourself. Uh, but between 0 and 300, that's what the other person will have. In S2, the, the interval gets reduced. <coughs> so the minimum that you can send back now is 25, and the maximum is 270. Uh, and S3 now is even more reduced. You have 65 to 210, and then the maximum is uh, maximum protection is between 100 and 150. Notice that if I choose 4, the minimum I can have is what I send. So, you know, it's a very easy decision. So you choose S4, then I can go to uh, 100 for sure. But the trade-off is that in this case, the maximum I can have is 150. Whereas here, I could have, uh, I could have a lot more. I could be getting 200, get even 300. So as, as, I, as we go down here, uh, the trade-off is most protection here, but lower social welfare, if you want, lower total welfare. Uh, 
lower uh, sum of welfare. And, and that's significant because that's what, what we are trying to model here is the idea that institutions that protect themselves are also costly. So, um, for example, now whenever we do, uh, we have a research project in this country, then we have to, to do lots of bureaucracy like these papers, they constrain which hotels you can go to, uh, you write this paper, and, and even after doing all this, the government can come back at the end and tell you, oh, you have to re-justify all these things, and maybe six years after you were to a conference, they're asking you why, why did you take a taxi cab rather than public transportation, or why, why do you sleep in a hotel that was, that was costing 110 rather than 90? And you know you waste a lot of time. You waste your time. You waste the time of the of your your assistant. You you waste the time of the of the basically the, the civil servant that has to check all these things. So that protects us against the the fact that some people might take the research money and go to a marisqueria and have all this nice seafood. Uh, but that has a cost, okay? And that's sort of the trade -off that we're trying to model here. It's at a cost, and we can prevent that people take advantage of it. Yes, sir. So, Ian, what I understood is that you wanted to test whether uh, trusts and institutions were complement or uh, substitutes, right? But by designing this uh, protection uh, uh, set, uh, aren't you kind of imposing that trusts and institutions are substitutes? Um, by, by, well, by you, you see exactly what I mean when I talk about the substitution. What I'm going to say is um, now, in fact, l let me do preempt this because <coughs> it could be that you, you you choose this. And what we're going to see is that individuals that used when there were no institutions that used to behave well and send back lots of money, when you, when we have institutions and and you actually give them the choice to be a nice person, now they are not anymore a nice person. So it could be complement. It could be the fact that you're so the fact that you've trusted me, and you've asked for no protection. Then I say, wow, you're really a nice guy. You could have protected yourself. You didn't. So I'm going to actually be super nice to you. So if in the past I was giving you 150, now I'm going to give you 200 because you just made my day. You just trusted me. Yeah. And what we find is just the opposite. And it will be more precise in a second. But that's, that's the sense in which we find substitutes rather than confidence. It's the fact that the institution now exists says, oh, you could have protected yourself. You didn't. Well, you know, screw you. I'm going to actually take the money and run. And that's, that's what we will see. So do these options change both the expected value and the variance of the possible outcomes for us? Obviously, they, yeah. It's, right? There's a smaller value, there's a more variation. Right. Smaller variation. So then how do, do you deal with, with that? Um, so I'm thinking. I'm not so much interested in the variance. What I'm, what I'm interested here is what's the level of protection that people choose and how that is related, first of all, with your experience, which was the initial question, but also with the model, in the, the mode in which we make this choice. Because this is what we call institutions of purchase, and then we'll see what happens when there is a collective agreement about this. So the collective agreement uh, is here, so it's the voting institutions. So again, uh, in phase two, phase one is the same. Uh, in, in the voting treatments, players are divided into group one, those with turn more than 150 and those with turn more, so that's the same. And players now, rather than actually choosing S1 through S4, now it's a collective decision. We have to make a decision which one of these uh, levels of protections we choose. Now it's four options and there's a bunch of people voting, so it was not simple to decide how we're going to make this choice because it would use a simple majority we would do we didn't want to do several rounds of voting we could have done several rounds of voting but because of the way this uh, this is organized doing several rounds of anything is complicated so we went from a, a, a procedure that is uh, was invented by these guys in fact we went to if we ever design an experiment uh, we were a bit puzzled about exactly what to choose, we saw the difficulties. So we went to the experimental, uh, no, the Economic Science Association, the Association of the Experimentalists has a forum 
in which you can ask questions. So we crowdsource the answer to our question, which is, we have this problem, it's a choice between four, we need to do it one shot. Is there a way to somehow provide a good solution? And someone came up with this, uh, I mean, they came up with several interesting suggestions, but someone came up with this uh, paper by Carson McDaniel, in which they say, okay, one procedure that you can have is make everyone make all the pairwise pairwise choices that are possible, says so one is two, is one is, is, is three, is one is four, is two is three, is two is four, is three is four. Yeah, that's six possible uh, binary options and make everyone choose in all the binary options plus the preferred alternative. And then uh, there's a procedure that's called maximum acyclic, uh, maximum likelihood acyclic ranking that actually is guaranteed to always choose one. Uh, more importantly, uh, it has the property that that if a uh, uh, Condorcet winner exists, it will always choose the Condorcet winner. If a Condorcet winner doesn't e exist, then it chooses with this proce proce procedure. I actually don't really know strictly how it works. We just program it. Uh, these guys prove that if voting is sincere, uh, then this will avoid uh, strategic voting. So it has some... Uh, some advantages and we go for it. To the participants in the experiment, all we said is make all these votings and then the most popular one wins. I don't know how they interpreted it, but we thought that if we go into expl explaining maximum likelihood acyclic ranking, people are going to stop reading uh, after a second, so it's just some procedure to choose this. Okay, so that's what they do. Uh, and again, people are informed what the, the group they're in, and then they choose uh, amount given the option, uh, you know, S1, S2 selected in the group. So they choose whether to trust or not to trust. And then we did, in here, we did two treatments. Uh, we did you, your votes, you're going to do all these votes, but your vote only counts if you're selected to be the sender. Remember that this is a strategy method, so you say what you're going to do as a sender or you, what you're going to do as a receiver. And we told them that if you're picked uh, to be the sender, then your vote counts, otherwise it doesn't count. That's one treatment. And the other one, your vote counts independently of whether you're the sender or the receiver. Now, why did we do this? Okay, so the reason is the following. Um, if you vote as a, as a sender, as a receiver, uh, at the time when you're voting, you have to anticipate that you, are, you might be the sender, in which case your, your uh, action, the level of protection that you're choosing is going to protect you. But if you're a receiver and you count to take advantage of the other guy, you know that the vote that you did now is actually going to constrain you in terms of taking advantage of the other guy. So that might lead to a different kind of answer. Uh, and in fact, originally we didn't, we had not done the vote sender. So that's the more realistic one, because in reality, when you vote for a level of institutions or bureaucracy or something, you, uh, you're both in the position of someone that is going to take advantage of the institutions or you're going to be protecting the institutions. So, so that's the realistic one. That's not realistic. But the point is that we observe a very difficult, very different relationship between this treatment and the other treatment. Uh, in the treatment in which you actually purchase protection, as we will see, people decide to, uh, to purchase a lot of protection. In this treatment, people choose very little protection. And then we said, well, of course, no, I said, uh, of course the reason is that since you vote as a, as a sender or a receiver, you anticipate that sometimes you want to take advantage of the other, of the other people and therefore uh, you don't want protection because you want to, you know, you want to you know, be able to rip the other guy off. Uh, but, you know, Roberto, one of our co-authors who is a more, you know, careful experimentalist than I said, you know, uh, Antonio, that's jumping, you know, too much because it's true that this is a change between the two treatments, but there's a bunch of other changes between the two treatments. How can you attribute this simply to the fact that now you are sender or receiver? I said, but there is a clean way to do this. And the clean way to do this is ask what happens if people can vote as senders only, because then the only change between this 
is that here you're voting only as a sender, and here you're voting as a sender, but also someone that can take advantage. Now let's see what happens. So that's that's why we did it this way. Okay? Not because we think this is particularly um, uh, particularly realistic. Okay. So now the payoffs are actually the same under the four institute in terms of what the receiver can do if society votes for level of protection one, then it's again C to C hundred. If uh, is, uh, society votes for S2, then you know it's exactly the same. So the payoffs are the same. The only thing that changes is the mode in which you choose the level of protection. It's individual versus collective. Okay, so that's it. That's it for the design. So now we can go uh, to the results and there's there more questions here. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there's a phase three, of course, that I was forgetting. So uh, here we have, uh, you know, different criteria because we wanted to somehow see the extent to which some personal characteristics might be influencing your choices. We wanted to be able to see what's, what's going on. So one thing is risk aversion that might be connected because if a trusting relationship, you're taking a, you're taking a risk in a sense of the other individuals. So we wanted to see to which extent this... Uh, uh, is related to your preferences towards risk. Uh, so we, we did something on to test. Uh, so There's a bunch of dictator games that can detect whether I knew it is more or less pro-social, more or less averse to inequality. Uh, and that's what we're measuring here, because in a sense, your attitudes towards trust have to do with uh, your moral preferences towards uh, distribution. Uh, we did a cognitive reflection test, uh, so that's a test that has a bunch of questions. It's a little bit like an IQ test, but it measures something different. So a cognitive re reflection test has, uh, has a bunch of questions, all of which have a very intuitive answer that is wrong. Uh, and then if you see, if you stop to think for a second, <coughs> They're not difficult enough that if you stop to think for a second, you know, figure it out, but you need to stop to think for a second. If you just go ahead and, and answer, then we wanted to see to which extent, you know, that might make a difference. And then a bunch of sociodemographic nationality and their age, uh, level of education, and so on. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, so here, uh, first of all, uh, no one asked why we choose 150 to distinguish between uh, sender and receiver. So between the low trustworthiness and high trustworthiness, and the reason is we chose 150 because in some pilots uh, that we have done with the trust game, in this particular version of the trust game, we have noticed that 150 was something that actually divided the population more or less equally, and it was sufficiently different between the two of them. So indeed, uh, in the group, that returns 150 or more, then the majority of people uh, do 200, a few of them do 150. <coughs> In the group that says less than 150, there's a bunch of them that send back zero. <laughs> so they're really not very nice people. A bunch of them said one, send 100, which says, okay, I'm not going to make you lose, but I, you're not going to earn a dime from me. So really, these are two quite different populations. So it makes sense to uh, differentiate them in this way. And they are actually quite different. Okay, so in terms of sending behavior, uh, in the so there's not a perfect correlation between being trustworthy or being trusting. Uh, so in the peop in the uh, the people that send a hundred or fifty or more, they are a bit more trusting, but they're not completely trusting. So there's so you can be a nice person in giving back. But you might be clever enough to realize that not everyone in the room are nice people, and therefore you'd say, okay, I might be a nice person if I'm on the, on the receiving side, but on the sending side, I'm not going to trust you. Um, and, but there is some correlation, because in the, in the people that are not very trustworthy, they, of course, they do a little introspection, and they say, you know, the people might be like me, so maybe I shouldn't say that. Okay, so some correlation, but not perfect between trusting and, and so on. All right, so here are the, the, the more important results, which is the, the one that have to do with the demand for institutions. So first, in the purchase, in the first treatment, in the one in which I make the decision individually, I don't take into account anyone else, uh, you can see that uh, in this case, in the, in the 
when you are in a bad group, when people are not very trustworthy, then there's a lot more demand for protection. So if you're in a good group when most people are trustworthy, then you, you don't demand that much protection. You do a little bit, but not that much. So mm -hmm. that's very significant, the difference between, between the two of them. So answer that's an answer already to our first question. Why do people require institutions to protect themselves? Probably because they fear what the others are going to do, and it's a rational fear, so it's uh, not surprising. Uh, in terms of the uh, demand for institutions uh, in the in the voting when you're the, just the sender, okay. Here you can see that uh, if you're voting and you're the sender, then it's in a sense similar to what happens in the in the when you decide individual. So if you're so, so if you're only the sender, then uh, if you're in a high trustworthiness group, you tend to vote for low institutions, so one or two rather than three or four. Uh, whereas if you're in a low trustworthiness group, you, you tend to vote a lot more for high institutions than for low institutions. So those seem to be similar. And that was more or less the point, because the important comparison is this one. When you're voting <coughs> both as a sender, as a receiver, there's a lot less demand. In fact, there is very little demand for high protection. So if you are in a, you, if you are both the person that can uh, take advantage or uh, the person that is potentially taking advantage, then you go all the time for no protection or little protection. But yes. then you said that when you are in a group that is uh, not really trustworthy, you behave in a different way. But I mean, this they, is, they, this know, is they know that they are in a group. Yes, yes, yes. They are told that you are going to be in the group too. But that doesn't make sense. No? You are already advised, telling him that you are in a bad group. No, no, of course, of course. But like notice that otherwise that it would be kind of suicide, like a suicide. Yeah, yes, no, no. So what I'm saying is, if you are living a so what we first thing we've established is if you are in a society where people are tricksters, then you want protection. So it's it's in a sense rational to want protection if there are lots of people that want to take advantage but of you. Suppose that you don't tell them that in which type of society they are. So do you think that they will react themselves? No. In no, the same way, no. just as the way they perceive themselves, like. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so if all these people, I don't know how these people is, yeah. but if all these people behave in the same way, they did, I'm fine. So I'm going to take protection. So in this sense, I think that's uh, yes. Yeah. No, no. So for sure. So, so, but the first question was, do you want to ask for protection when you are in an environment where people, when you need the protection? And the answer is yes, but not always. So the first surprise is this one over here. These people are in a world in which people are kind of not very nice. At least these guys are in a in a world in which people are not very nice, and yet they don't want protection. Why they don't want protection? My answer is, and this is by comparing it with, with this one, in which you are in a, in a world, here you're in a world in which people are kind of not nice, and yet I do want protection. Why? Because here, I, the only time where my vote counts is when I, when I actually can use the protection for myself. Whereas here, sometimes the protection is going to hurt me because occasionally I want to take advantage of the other guys. And I waited too and I said, look, how much more I benefit when I am ripped off and when I'm ripping off. I want to take my chances and be able to rip off the other guys. But it means that here you have three things, actually. You have trust, institutions, and opportunistic behavior. Yes. And uh, institutions is a burden to uh, exercise opportunistic behavior. That's, that's the point. Right? Yeah, and, you don't, and that's why you don't want it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you want to no, be opportunistic. No, but I mean that you really have three elements here. It's not just trust and institutions. Yeah. There is the other element as well, which is plain. So, you need to repeat this. Yeah, so uh, again, going back to your introduction, I, uh, I, I do this paper like the testing whether institutions and trust are complements or substitutes. Not yet. So we're, we're not yet at the point of, of, of looking at, at, um, at complements versus substitutes. For the time being, all I'm doing is I'm answering the question whether people demand institutions because they want protection, and the answer is yes. And second, whether the way in which the demand is expressed, that is individual or social, makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So that's the yeah. complements or substitutes is going to come. Yeah, but, but I mean, again, 
you demand uh, protection because uh, you were obviously you want to be protected from these plastic eyes. But at the same time, because you can be on the other side, you uh, you might want to exercise okay. opportunistic uh, behavior. Yes. You don't want institutions. So That's right. two conflict in yeah, two. Uh, exactly. And yeah. and what I'm saying here is that in the conflict, what wins is the chance to be able to take advantage of the others seems to be very important to these mm -hmm. guys. They yeah. want to be able yeah. to take advantage of the others. the difference between those two, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. okay. So now we've answered a couple of, of the questions that we started with, but the, this other one that is important as well, we wanted to, you know, this will need a bit more effort to answer that. Okay, so we did, uh, you know, not just, uh, so we, so far, the analysis in terms of the comparison between treatments has been done uh, with non-parametric tests, but we wanted to do some, some regressions in part to find out whether some of these other moderating variables that we were using in, in stage three had any influence. And I've kept in this table only those that variables that made, uh, made an impact. And in particular, it turns out that in terms of the whether people prefer high institutions, uh, it's only in the, in the, in the group with, uh, in the nice group, the people that are envious, they want protection for some reason. Um, and the people who are compassionate, so who are kind of uh, altruistic and so on, they, they don't want. So, but only in the high, in the high, uh, in trustworthiness group in the other, even envy and compassion don't make a, a big difference. Also, people who sent a lot of money in the first part, they, uh, and this is true in both, uh, in both groups, they also need less protection. So <coughs> uh, the more you, I mean, the fact that you sent makes you less, you know, you, you, in a sense, people don't completely internalize the behavior of the others, so even these guys, that were nice. Even in the in the bad in the bad group, they demand less protection. So, um, and those are the only ones. So risk for in, to our surprise, risk aversion didn't seem to play a role. Uh, all the sociodemographics that we used apparently don't make a difference. So we're not that different in that in that respect. And the and the sample cut had quite variation. So that's one of the nice things of of uh, the mechanical Turk that you have people of more, you know, very different ages and, and, uh, and very different education levels. And that, those don't seem to make a difference here. And I guess people pay only once, I mean, as yes. both sender and receiver, but only once. Yes. Okay. Maybe the amount of money is a small, and then there's a reason why this conversion is It could be. Important. It could be. Okay. It's yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, if, if I have tons of money from the European Union to run this experiment, uh, I, I, this, is, this is one experiment where having playing it for large stakes would make a difference. Um, the way, so when you want to run experiments with large stakes, the trade-off is either you go to a sample, uh, you know, a smaller sample, and then you, each of them makes a lot of money, Occasionally, sometimes what people do is they go to a country where wages are very low and you play it among people with low wages and then even as what for us looks like a small amount of money for them it could be, could be that. So if you play in, uh, 100 euros in a, in a country where the average you know, income per day is, is you know, 2 euros or 20 euros, then you know, it's a lot of money. So, so that's what I would do. Okay, so what we've seen so far is that um, subjects in the voting and the purchase treatment are equally likely to demand uh, high institutions. No difference across treatments for the high trustworthiness groups and when both senders and receivers vote, so that's the, the main result there, there is a lower demand for institutions in the low trustworthiness group. In a sense, what we're saying is voting might not be the best mechanism to provide to provide protection when people can be on both sides of the of the decision, uh, and that's why sometimes you might need a, a private uh, institution to protect yourself. Okay, so that's the first part, uh, and then you can compare uh, for the high trustworthiness groups. Then so these are the payoffs, and you can see that payoffs are highest under low 
uh, institutions, which makes sense. And Melodra's worthiness groups, it depends on whether you are the sender or the receiver. So for receivers, uh, which are these guys, then the lowest amount is gotten under the high institutions. And the, uh, the, um, uh, for the senders, uh, you get more money under the high institutions. And that's the conflict, in a sense. That's the trade-off that you were talking about. If I'm both the sender and the receiver, then I'm in conflict between these two things. And that's why you end up choosing low protection. OK. Um, That's basically what I said. All right, so now let's go to the second question, the one that has to do with, uh, with uh, complements versus substitutes. We're going to do it through the uh, individual return behavior. So this is for the purchase treatment. This is how much people return under the different uh, treatments. So for the high trustworthiness and the low trustworthiness group, you can see that in the high trustworthiness group, then people return less as the level of institutions go up, in part because they're, const they're restricted. There's, there's, no, there's no way they can return much more. In the low trustworthiness groups, mechanically, you, you force them to go up as the institutions uh, go up. OK. Um, in voting as senders, and, and in voting, both as sender only or, or as a sender receiver, you see a similar pattern of behaviors. You can even see that the numbers are very similar. So, 172, 118, 49, 105. If you go here, it's very similar. 170, 117, 14, 104. Uh, in fact, the uh, return behavior is also not that different uh, in the voting as both sender and receiver. So voting behavior is, is very similar. Now, the thing that is, uh, well, and this, this just basically says the same thing with, uh, with um, uh, with regressions. You can see that the only thing that explains stuff is whether you're in the, in the low or the high trustworthiness groups, but whether you're voting uh, sender, sender, or receiver, or you're in the, in the purchase treatment, it's, it's very similar. You can see that in, for the, uh, <coughs> the trustworthiness, the only thing that seems to matter is compassion. So altruistic people tend to be more, um, tend to be more, uh, Trustworthy. More, more, more or less, the other things are not important. Not risk aversion and so on. So it's only, it's, it's, it's actually, in a sense, it's not too, too surprising because the, the, the decision to return money, there's no uncertainty involved. There's, you know, so that's why it's, it's understandable that it's only really whether you are more or less altruistic that makes a difference. Oops. Okay, so now one thing that uh, I haven't told you, um, I think it's because I don't have here the comparison with the with the other treatment. Okay, so um, when the level of institutions is low, when it's one, uh, this is the amount that is returned. So it's on the other 170 and 49. Uh, in, in both groups. So this is the group that is more interesting. It's 172. If you go back to the return behavior, so this is in phase two. Uh, if you go to the return behavior in phase one, I have it in here. Um, return behavior. So you can see here that the high trustworthiness group returns on average, 193. <coughs> and it's 47 in the low. So low, low trustworthiness group, these numbers are very similar to the ones in the, in, the, in the second phase. But this is significantly higher. Mm -hmm. So uh, we observe a very strong decrease in the amount that is returned in the second phase uh, in phase two under low institutions. So these numbers. For the high trust working, these these are very similar, but this number is this is literally the same environment that you're playing in phase one and phase two. Mm -hmm. So if you are under institution S1, uh, then you literally can do exactly the same as you were doing uh, in in phase one. And yet these people, are, which are high trust workers, they're returning much less than they were doing in the first phase. 
And this is a suggestion, for the time being it's just a suggestion that institutions are uh, substitutes rather than complements. In principle, in principle, uh, one could observe uh, the opposite. One could observe that here, I am in this, in this world, this individual could have protected himself, he didn't, and therefore I'm going to be extra nice to him. I'm going to be even nicer than before, where he didn't have a, a choice to protect himself, so I might give him you know, more than 190, I'm going to give 250, 300. And they don't. And, and that's the first suggestion that we are in, in substitutes rather than complements. And originally, again, I, I uh, so I will put it you know, first person, I wanted to say, that's it. That's the proof that institutions are substitutes rather than complements because of this comparison between the first and the second case. And again, it was Roberto, I have to give him uh, credit. So he said, actually, I don't know. Just like the game <coughs> when, when you purchase institution and the game which you vote are different in more than one dimension, here you also have differences in more than one dimension. So it's you're the second phase, you're in one group rather than the other. Uh, you you don't have the option to not re not uh, not send money, whereas in before you had the option to not send money, um, and you know there's a bunch of differences. So you, we need to control for all these things. So now I'm going to explain you a few um, extra treatments that we did to actually say that this. I want to suppress this suggest and actually assert that in fact institutions are substitute for other and that's and, and this is how we did. Okay. Um, now, first of all, the differences between this, these two, uh, phase one and phase two is, first of all, you know that you're in a group. You know they're in the high or the low trustworthiness group that somehow relates to your question. At the, you know, when you're starting, you don't know. Now you know, so that might tell you something. So, um, the other is, Institutions ex before, in phase one, these, these institutions, these levels of protection didn't exist. Now they do exist. So that's, a that's another different difference. And the third one is four levels existed. Your partner chose low protection. That's another difference. In the other case, he didn't have, your partner didn't have a chance to be protected or not protected. Now he has a chance to be protected. So we want to see which of these is uh, the, the actual reason for the difference between phase one and phase two. So we chose four different treatments to understand this crowding out of, uh, of the civic spirit. So treatment one is <coughs> with the only institution that exists in phase two is S1. And uh, there's also the possibility not to send for the, for the sender. And um, and this tries to measure, this treatment one tries to measure the effect of knowing where, which group I'm in. <coughs> There's only one institution, but now I'm told I'm in group one or in group two. And the difference between this treatment one and the behavior in, in the other game is uh, it measures the, the effect of participating in a group with respect to the first phase. Hmm? Comparing first phase one and phase two, the only thing that changes is being in a group or, or not being in a group. Treatment two is now I add uh, these institutions S1 to S4, but they're going to be chosen by nature. So rather than someone chose it, your partner chose it, is nature chose between S1 and S4. Okay. So now uh, the comparison between treatment one and treatment two tells you, in addition to the effect of the group, what the, the effect of the existence of an institution, which in this case is not chosen, it just came from heaven. And then <coughs> treatment one, treatment three, and treatment four is the same one where now the institution says <coughs> one to S4 is voted, and now there is also the possibility not to say. Okay, so those are the, the way we are doing the comparisons. <coughs> Alright, so first of all, uh, this graph that I have in here, I'm going to do the difference uh, in between group one and group two of uh, the difference in, in how much I, I give uh, between phase one and phase two. Okay. So 
In group zero, this is the group where this is the low trustworthiness group, and this is the difference in sending behavior between, uh, between the first phase and the second phase. And this is the difference between the first phase and the second phase uh, in, in group one. And as you can see, in neither of these groups, there's any difference. So knowing in which group you are doesn't make any difference how much you contribute between phase zero and phase one. Okay. So that's not the, so what created the change, uh, so what made this, this uh, <coughs> difference in sending back behavior between phase one and phase two in the original experiment could not be simply that I'm told I'm in group low or group high trustworthiness because in both cases, in phase one of these both groups, I was, I didn't know where I was and, and when I go to the second stage and I'm told where I am, then the, you know, it doesn't make a difference in how much I continue. Notice though that these are different people. So the people that were, that are in group one were kind of the bad guys, in, and, but it's just that the bad guys don't behave, or this is the good guy. The good guys don't behave any differently in, uh, in the two stages of the game and, and the bad guys don't defend, uh, behave any differently in the two stages of the game. Okay, so the group does not seem to matter. Okay, now this is with the, the presence of institutions, and now again, the difference between phase one and phase two. Uh, <coughs> and this is in the, in the uh, when the institutions are, are randomly chosen. So this is the difference between there's only S0 and S1, and this is when institutions are randomly chosen in group, um, I think this is group one, and this is group zero, okay? So in the first treatment, there was no difference. Basically, there's no significant difference between phase one and phase two. Now, once I introduce uh, uh, institutions, now suddenly the people that were nice, then they behave less, less nicely in the second phase. Okay? Significantly less nicely in the second phase. Whereas for the bad guys, they didn't behave nicely before, but there's no difference in between phase one and phase two, and there's no difference between phase one and phase two once we have institutions. So the presence of institutions, uh, when, you're, when they're uh, randomly chosen, uh, appears to make a difference. So this is, the, this is at least one key component in the, in the difference. So it's the existence, the mere existence of institutions, even if people were not choosing them, uh, says that now, uh, in a sense, this, uh, this uh, reminds me of the, of the effect uh, that we observed. If, if, you, if you know this experiment that Nisi and Rustichini have with the uh, preschools in, um, in, uh, in Israel, in which uh, at some point a preschool decided to change a policy when you go back, when you, when you go to take your kids back from the preschool, um, they started finding the parents who arrived late, okay? And what they observed is once you start finding the parents who arrived late, then more people arrive late. And the explanation they have in mind is before uh, <coughs> you started finding them, you thought that, you know, Arriving late to pick up your child was a bad thing. So you, you try to arrange your workday so that you don't arrive late. And then, but once uh, arriving late is something that has a price, you, you pay a fine, a fine is a price, that's the title of the paper, then you say, ah, okay, so this means that if I arrive late, all I have to do, it's not that I, I'm a bad person, it's that I'm a person who has money to pay a, a fine, and I pay the fine, and that's it. So then I don't arrange my workday around this, so I'll, I go on and and what they said is, okay, once you make people change the way they perceive the situation, then they say, ah, okay, so this is something that could be, so here, in a sense, it's similar in spirit. I, know I used to be a nice guy because I thought that's what I had to do, I want a nice guy. Now someone tells me, oh, by the way, there's this, all this protection could have existed. <coughs> the protection could have existed. So maybe I'm not an, a bad guy, it's simply that some idiot uh, randomly decided not to make protection available. So maybe it's not I'm a bad guy, I'm just using an opportunity that appears for me. And then, boom, that's what happens. Uh, of course, the bad guys always behave badly, so they, these guys don't care. But it's the good guys for whom this has. It's, it's, in, the, it's in, the, in the preschool, it's, it's not the, the bad, the guys who were arriving late 
always, they, this, they didn't make a difference. Now we just have to pay a fine. But the, buy, the guys who were arriving promptly, they shifted this from seeing a market transaction versus you know, being nice or not nice. And that might be something that's going on here. Yes? Yeah. Uh, just a Could it be a lot of information? I mean, you behave in a way because you believe that the world works. Yes. Once you get some more information, there is an institution. Yes. So this institution is telling you that maybe the world doesn't work. That's right. Work in the world. That's, that's, precisely, that's precisely our explanation. It's once you're provided the information that the world <coughs> is not a world in which we need to behave nicely, but rather a world in which you have to behave in the way that people tell you. Say, okay, so they didn't tell me to behave well, but then I will behave well, and then it will happen. That's it. And, and then I, I don't see that. Uh, so this, what you just explained, with that saying, well, if you, you know, when you know uh, to which group you belong, then you you you, you don't change, change your behavior. But you already know it because you know. To which group you know, because you already expressed. So yes, you but create the groups but after you know, the vote, after yes. sending. So you they, they have already expressed which will belong to. Yes, but but in the first phase, you are in a world in which uh, people might be nice or not nice. Afterwards, once you're told, now you're in a world in which everyone is like you, therefore they are not nice, or therefore they are all nice. Do you know who you are sending to? Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. I, and people sending to nice people is, 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 what behave the same way as people, nice people sending to, to bad people? Uh, no, they send less. They send less. But it's the return behavior that we're concentrating here. It's what's your return behavior like if you're in a bad group? or in a, if you're in a good group. So it could be that the reason why there's a difference has to do with whether I'm in a good group or in a bad group, when between the first phase and the second phase. But that's not what's going on. So what's creating here is the institutions are cry, crowding out uh, good behavior. OK, I'm almost done here. Uh, because the, the next phase is the, the presence of institutions that are, that are voted upon. And then you see that now, between the previous treatment and this treatment, there's no difference anymore. So the only difference is uh, when you create the institution, when you make people aware that an institution exists. Whether they were chosen by the other or not, doesn't seem to make a difference. So we've isolated the single factor that appears to make a difference in this case. OK, now with regressions, uh, again, we, f we see something that I've already demonstrated, which is compassion and envy are the only things that might make a difference in, in what you will send. And then with this, I can conclude. So uh, basically, the conclusions, I've already mentioned them. So there is demand for institutions. They ask them because they, they are in a bad environment. The way you vote matters, but also um, the substitute that the institution seem to be a substitute rather than a complement for civic speak. And yeah, then we'll tie up. Thank you. So um, so your main result um, uh, made me um, I think about uh, the, the the example also you mentioned about the northern countries. Um, isn't it the case that uh, their uh, trust and people would implement institutions so there's no high demand for better institutions because trust is part of the institution <coughs> story? Like, for example, uh, in Denmark, in your, if, in, your, in your neighborhood, if you see a car with, with a Swedish plant, you would report that immediately because you know this guy is cheating. Uh, he's trying to avoid the Danish tax. So basically, people, you know, uh, uh, the, the trust you have, you know, that nobody would do that. And if somebody does it, you would report it right away. Yes. So they uh, they implement the institution. They are the institutions. Therefore, you don't have people, uh, you know, yeah. ranging. Uh, around to, to implement the, the law. 
that's true. So <coughs> what you're saying is that is that in fact the reason why trust exists is because there's some kind of well functioning informal institutions. So yeah. I could say formal versus informal institutions right. are right. probably at work. So right. that's that I think that's a good that's a good way of explaining. Right, it. right, right. Oh, yeah. So this is what you mentioned at the beginning, that social norms are related to trust. So yes. Yes, yes, no. yes. In a, in a sense it's, it's this formal versus informal institutions. So we need formal institutions because the informal institutions between yeah. outside the family let's say are not working very much in some area. But that's what we need to For instance, you have unions everywhere. But the way that uh, collective bargaining is done is quite different. And in fact, because uh, management and workers, management and unions, sometimes have uh, a business relationship or a, or a collaborative relationship uh, in some countries and some others not. The institution itself is the same. What changes is the interaction between Mm, you know, social norms or, or culture or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, but with, with the institution. With the, with the unions, but I was what I was talking about is the fact that because the the relationship between the social norm between the workers and the and the firms don't don't work well enough, then the workers insist that there is a law that protects their kind of their their bargaining position and doesn't allow you to fire workers at will like it happens in other countries. So even in Denmark you can fire workers at will uh, and, and the workers accept it because they know that someone is going to take care of them. So in a sense it's the because the informal institution works you don't need a formal law that, that protects you. So it's the it's the kind of the informal institution between the social kind of uh, partners <coughs> Uh, it's important to whether we need a law to enforce this rule or this rule or that rule or the other rule. So you don't need the government to start intervening in the in the bargaining because you know that I can I can I know as a worker I can trust my company to bargain in good faith. Whereas in southern countries, since I know that the, the company is not going to bargain in good faith, I want the government to intervene and say, you know, if uh, if the bargain the global bargain is not agreed to and, and my company is not in it is up, the, the global bargain applies equally to uh, to it and then Luna, sorry, sorry. do you think that because you said that uh, uh, people from the US and India would participate then you think that that may make a change I mean, have some impact so for sure, but, but this is this is why we use the, the within group uh, differences in trust. So even in northern Europe, even in southern Europe, there is a distribution of trust. Not, not everyone is equally trusting. So what we are exploiting here is the fact that even within countries, there are people who are more trustworthy or less trustworthy, and that's how we kind of simulate society. We sim we simulate a good functioning society with the less than sorry, more than 150, and a bad functioning society is the one with less than 150. So, but I was wondering, how to control centered experiment? I mean, they enter just in the OLS that you showed? How do you control? I mean, when you control for risk, uh, it is compliant. Yes, yes. They just enter in the final OLS. Yes. Because I was thinking, like, if I am in phase one, I mean, the decision that I take in phase one uh, would be like uh, very much dependent on my risk aversion, right? It, it doesn't. No, that's it. It doesn't. No, no, oh. it doesn't. Um, Is it weird? Um, it, it's been found in other experiments, oh, okay. so it's it's not so unusual. Although uh, Pablo Brañas has been telling me that he's with some colleagues uh, has been doing experiments in many labs around Spain. And in their results that they have so far, they do find some co some correlation between trust and uh, and risk aversion. Yeah, I, I, that's what I was thinking. <coughs> that eventually it doesn't come out significant because of multicollinearity, but that's something that uh, probably influences phase one in the way I'm assigned to one group or to, to the other. Well, so in the re in the regressions we can control for things. We already did the, the study at the at the phase one level. So even there, we didn't we didn't observe a correlation between okay. between this and uh, yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay.